Well, good morning. It is so good to see you. Thank you so much for being here today. As we get started, let me remind you, we have those cadet cards. If you'll take those and drop those in the baskets as you, as you leave today, along with any offering that you might happen to have. Um, and as you're uh, doing that, let me share with you just a, a few announcements. Uh, know that as we're getting ready to do a few things as we open up more and more as the community continues to heal and we get more vaccine and healthier, uh, we're able to do more uh, around here. So the most uh, um, immediate thing that we're going to do is Sunday school. Most of you know this, but starting next week, we'll be back in Sunday school. Some of the classes have moved around. Uh, so that we can have social distancing and get the bigger classes in the bigger rooms so I uh, can socially distance. And then the ch that is going to children's department up on the third floor. Uh, so some things are moving around. We're also adding a Sunday school class at the 11 o'clock hour uh, for a short-term Sunday school class if anybody's interested in, in that. So we're excited about that. And also, I made the announcement today uh, that... Um, Holy Week is coming up really soon. We're going to have a Monday, Thursday service, and you can sign up to, uh, to come to that in person, make a reservation, um, and we'll also live stream it. Our Good Friday service uh, will be here at noon, and we'll do it like we've done it in, in the past with the, uh, with the Presbyterian Church. We don't feel a need to make reservations for that because it's usually not uh, too many people come to that noon uh, service. And then, of course, Easter Sunday. And we just really want to celebrate Easter. And we have not been able to gather the whole church together in over a year. So we want to do that. And if you haven't heard, uh, we're going to do that at uh, the Woodland Football Stadium. And so we're going to have our Easter service there. And that way, everybody can come. The whole community can come. We can socially distance. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to have a great time uh, there. Just uh, begin now doing a few things, making plans to be there. Also inviting your friends and neighbors and family and other church folks who you haven't seen for a while. Tell them they can come. They can socially distance as far as they feel comfortable. They can be, you know, 50, 100 yards away if, they, if they'd like to uh, be. Uh, but invite them to do that. And then also wouldn't hurt to pray for good weather as well for that day. So we're excited about that. What a joy to be in the house of the Lord and to be able to worship together on this day. As we gather here in this place, we gather for that specific purpose, to worship God to sing, to pray, to hear God's word, and to listen to what God would have to say to us this day. So as we prepare our hearts to worship, I say, the Lord is with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, how grateful we are to be here. Lord, your Holy Spirit is here already. We know that. May it now just fill our hearts with joy and celebration so that we might worship you in spirit and truth. In Christ we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is I Stand Amazed in the Presence. The words are in your bulletin. Would you stand please as we sing together.
continue to remain standing as we reaffirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe, I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of, of heaven, heaven and earth, and, earth, and in and Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, our Lord, Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered, suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was crucified, dead, dead and buried. The, the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. time we go to our Lord together in prayer and speaking of prayer uh, we wanted to make sure that we're praying for for one another during this Lenten season so uh, you've got a little uh, a slip of paper of course a piece of paper in your your bulletin that's a little green paper uh, it simply says give thanks to the Lord for he's good his faithful love endures forever and it just says if you have a prayer request you'd like prayed over please write it there you can be anonymous, you can put your name on it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but we'll pray for whatever you'd like. And the prayer team and the staff and the pastors, Al and I, will be praying over these uh, during the remainder of the Lenten season. So if you would like us to be praying over a specific prayer concern, I invite you to uh, put whatever it is on here and just drop it in the little offering baskets on your way out of church and we'll be honored to do that. But as we gather here this day, I know that you came today with concerns in your heart and things you want to thank God for, things you want to celebrate. So if we'll just pause for a moment, we'll go to God each in our own way, then I'll lead us in a morning prayer. Let's pray together.
Oh, gracious and loving Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our friend. You are the God of heaven and earth. And Lord, you inhabit all that is. You inhabit all eternity, all that was and is and is to be. And yet, Lord, you chose to come and dwell among us. You're not just the God that's out there, but you are the God with us. You're the God within us. Your word tells us that you stand at the door and knock, and, and if we just open the door, you come in and live. Lord, I can't even begin to understand that. But I thank you for making that possible. To know that you live within my heart. To know your saving grace, your healing touch. Meaning for life. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your abiding presence. Lord, it's so good to be together here this day with you and with each other in this body of believers, whether they're sitting in this room or, or whether they're listening virtually through the air, Lord. We're sisters and brothers together. And we look forward to worshiping together week after week with you and with one another. Lord, so much has conspired to keep us apart over this last year. Viruses and diseases and, and fear and, and all kinds of things. But Lord, as we can, Lord, help us to come back together. Help us to value the gathering together of the saints. Help us to want to be together, to worship and to serve. Lord, we pray for those who need special prayer this day, for our teens, for our young people that face the daily pressure from their peers and from society, who face temptations on every hand. Lord, help them to make right choices and to take the right road, the high road, and to help us uphold them by prayer and by encouragement and by example. Lord, we pray for our little children. Lord, thank you for them. Lord, help us to do our very best to raise them in the way in which they need to be. Lord, there are so many here today with special needs in their own lives, need that special touch and reassurance, that special touch of, of healing or, or, or blessing or wholeness or direction, Lord. Bring healing and reconciliation to them. We pray for our church our local church. We pray for our national church, our denomination. We pray for the universal church, for the church around the world. We pray for our nation and our leaders. What awesome responsibilities they face. Give them wisdom and guidance that they may learn to depend upon you in those situations that are so critical and vital to everyone. Lord, help them to make the right decision, the holy decision, not the partisan decision or the easy decision. Lord, we pray for our military, for many of those who stand in harm's way even this very hour. And we pray, Lord God, for peace, for peace, for reconciliation. In troubled spots along the globe, in our own country, in our own community, and yes, Lord, even in our own church and even in our own hearts. We thank you for your presence in our service this day. Thank you, Lord God for hearing our prayers. Our faith and our confidence are in you today, for you never fail. All this we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say together in prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
As we come to our time of the word, I have to uh, make a little confession. The uh, green uh, prayer, Lenten prayer request that you got uh, was planned by the worship committee, and uh, Lynn chairs that, and it was supposed to be on uh, purple or violet paper. And uh, to play a practical joke, I had one printed on green and brought it home to her. Well, you know what happened. The green stuck when it wasn't supposed to. So you all got a green one, and it was supposed to be purple. Now, I could have told you it was green for St. Patrick's Day, but I, I must say sometimes when you play a prank, a practical joke, it doesn't work out exactly like you think it will, uh, and you have to live with the course of that, which goes right along with our sermon. Uh, it's fitting that today we're hearing a message about light and darkness because this is the day that we gave up an hour of darkness to gain an hour of light. Now that's what we're supposed to believe anyway. Uh, and uh, if all goes as planned, this will be the last time we go through this time change forward and backward, 
And uh, I think all of us will be glad if it stays just one place uh, and not have to deal with this because it's disrupting to say the least. Those aside, uh, I call you to uh, hear the word. It's printed in the bulletin. You may look in your Bible. Uh, from John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, I'll be reading in the Common English Bible. Just as Moses was lifted up, oh, excuse me, let me start off again. Just as Moses lifted up the stake in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only Son. This is the basis for judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness more than the light, for their actions are evil. All who do wicked things hate the light, and don't come to the light for fear that their actions will be exposed to the light. Whoever does the truth comes to the light so that it can be seen that their actions were done in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our thanks be to God. May we pray. O oh Lord my God, I pray that the words of my lip and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. To understand today's text, we need to go back in Scripture. I'll take you there without you having to turn, but we need to go back first into Genesis. They realize that in the beginning, God created human beings in his image, male and female, he created them. And God called his creation very good and loved his creation. <clears throat> Loved all the people there. Let me get a sip of water. Maybe a small sip. <clears throat> so, God created everybody in the beginning, loved everybody, and never ceased to love everybody. But if we go forward into Exodus, we find that the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt. Uh, and they weren't happy with this, and God wasn't happy with this, so Moses was sent to deliver them by God. Uh, and Moses brought them out in Egypt and carried them to the Promised Land, and the journey took about three weeks. Is that how you remember it? No, no, it's not how it's to be remembered. Uh, they spent uh, 40 years wandering around in the wilderness, and they kept moaning and groaning and complaining the whole time. And then they would repent, and then they'd moan and complain some more. Uh, and finally, God had had enough with their moaning and complaining, so he just let the poisonous snakes do what poisonous snakes do. You mess with them, they're going to bite you. And if they bite you, what are you going to do? Well, the best thing, you're going to get real sick, but probably you're going to die. And so they weren't happy about it, and they came to Moses and said, We've sinned. Uh, please pray to God to uh, uh, take away our sins. And Moses did, and God said, Make an image like a serpent and put it out of uh, a brass and put it up on a pole. And whenever anyone is bitten by a poisonous snake, they are to look at that, and if they have faith, they will not be harmed. And if they don't, the consequences are there. So, so Moses did that, and that's what's alluded to in our text today. Uh, the text is a, a, a much longer discourse in John's Gospel in the third chapter. Uh, Nicodemus uh, came to Jesus at night. And uh, theologians have had some fun with this. Uh, one main camp says uh, he came at night because he didn't want to be seen by anybody going to Jesus. Uh, and another camp says he came by night because he had heard the words of Jesus and he couldn't sleep. He was, he was troubled so, and he had to come and talk to him. Uh, I tend to go with the, the latter version. 
simply because I know if you take the story of Nicodemus to its end, at the end of John's gospel, when Jesus is dead on the cross, he goes and asks for the body of Jesus, risking his life. Now, he had to come to faith in this dialogue. But he, he comes and he says, uh, we know you're a great teacher, Jesus, but I, I, I just don't understand all of this. And so Jesus met him. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. We've got to understand Pharisees a moment. Uh, they believed in a resurrection. Uh, they believed that if there was just one day that every Jewish person would go without committing a trespass of any of the commandments, that the kingdom of God would be ushered in. Now, that was a wonderful belief, impossible. Uh, it wasn't just the Ten Commandments. That would have been hard enough in and of itself, but it had been expanded roughly 90-fold. So to even remember all of them, let alone think about not transgressing one, would be nigh on to impossible. So, so that part didn't work, but he came with his belief structure and his training and his understanding, and he really was coming and saying, Jesus, help me understand what you're saying. Uh, and Jesus hits him head on and says, you're a teacher of the people and you don't understand. Well, that's not what he expected to hear. I, I want some answers and you start chastising me. And then he says to him, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus says, <clears throat> Well, how can that be? I can't enter my mother's womb a second time. How can this be possible? And Jesus said, you must be born by water and the Spirit. And Nicodemus still didn't understand. And Jesus said, the wind blows where it will. Now, in Hebrew and Greek, the same word for breath, for spirit, and for wind is the same word. So it can have three meanings, and Jesus used those interchangeably in this. So Nicodemus struggled with his understanding, uh, and he thought about the wind. Now, we all understand wind perfectly today, uh, don't we? Uh, we, we, we? I mean... We get weather forecasts, and they're always 100% accurate. But somebody will be laughing. You mean they're not? Uh, you know, it, it's an amazing thing that um, you can look at 10 o'clock in the morning and see what is the weather going to be like at 2 in the afternoon, and it may or may not be what's forecast. Uh, we still don't understand, even though we understand uh, the winds in the upper atmosphere and the jet stream and how it swept down a few weeks ago and all the, the horrible weather that occurred, particularly in Texas, but we still don't understand it. We can't accurately predict it. Uh, it's a mystery to us, and that's okay because the Spirit of God is a mystery. Uh, but God moves because God loves all of us. Uh, and that was the message that Jesus was conveying to Nicodemus, that God loves us. You see, we need to receive that message. But things stand in the way, and those things are the world. Uh, and the world will tell us one thing, that um, there's many ways to salvation. Uh, and part of that's embraced within the church. Uh, many people feel, well, <clears throat> I could trace my family back uh, 20 generations, and they've been Christians. And that's a wonderful thing. But it doesn't entitle you to anything but a good knowledge of the Word. You see, salvation has to be accepted by each individual. You don't get it by your heritage. Uh, others think, well, I can work my way to salvation. If I do enough good things, I can have salvation. 
Well, you can do enough good things, and sometimes you can do a practical joke that doesn't work out exactly right. <laughs> and you know, I, you're not going to win on that one. So the only way for salvation is to accept it for what it is. It's a gift. But darkness doesn't like the gift because the gift of salvation is a gift of light. So let's think about darkness a minute. I can go back to my childhood. I wasn't uh, terribly afraid of the dark, although it was somewhat scary. Because, you know, in darkness, things can take on a different image than in good light. Just, there's just enough light there that you can make all types of things out of something that isn't there. Uh, I remember one thing uh, in broad daylight, my grandmother used to tell me to go into the chicken house. I mean, she always had 18 to 20 or more hens, and, and I never liked going in there. First of all, I didn't like the smell. But second, it was bright sunlight outside, and I'd go in, and it was always dark. And I wouldn't get very far within it before some hen would come flying up my face and, I mean, scare the fool out of me. I just, I didn't like going in there. But I was sent in from time to time. Sometimes I went in with mom. She never had that trouble. But um, they saw I was an easy target and they picked on me. Yeah, anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So, so you know, it was frightening. I, I read a, Another man's uh, account, and, and his was a little similar but different. Uh, he would go to his grandparents' farm uh, and, and spend the summer. And uh, he would be there, and they would send him to the cellar in the barn. And you had to go down steps to get to the cellar in the barn, and he didn't go in it very often. And uh, he was always fearful because you open the door, and it's pitch dark inside, and then you're fishing through cobwebs to get to the light switch to turn it on, and you're hearing all this scampering going on within this dark recess that's there, and you finally get the lights on and you see the scampering. There's mice and rats and sometimes snakes and other vermin in there, and you wait till they settle down, he'd say, and then he'd go get what he was after and hurry out with it, turn the light off, shut the door, and hope he didn't have to go back that day. Uh, you know, darkness is, is scary. It's real scary, and, and total darkness is completely scary. Uh, my sister told me the story that uh, she and my brother-in-law were newly married, and uh, he said it would be a good adventure. He used the word caving for her so she could understand it, and so they went caving. There was a beautiful waterfall back in this cave, and they were going to go see it. Well, they headed out with two flashlights, and uh, <clears throat> you can... Guess where this is going? Right away, my sister dropped her flashlight, and it quit working. So they're down to one flashlight, but they could go on, and, and it was a, a deep cave they were going in, not miles and miles, but it was far enough. And The farther they went in, the more my sister's mind started playing with her, and she finally said, Harper, I've, just, I've had enough. I, just, I, I don't want to go any farther. And he said, well, we're almost to the waterfall. That is so beautiful. And she said, I, I, I don't know. He said, well, do you mind if I go? And she said, well, that'll be all right. I said, I'll just sit here and wait on you. And, and after she said that, and she watched the light disappear as he went down with it, and she's realizing she's sitting there in total darkness, she thought, that's about the stupidest thing I've done other than coming in this cave, you know. I mean, what am I going to do? And so she starts <clears throat> imagining all manner of things that could happen. Uh, Harper could drop his flashlight and not be able to see to get back, or he could fall and injure himself and not be able to tell her, or worse, he could fall and kill himself, and she wouldn't even have a light to go find him. And, oh, all of these things were going through her head, and she was a nervous frenzy when finally she saw a little bit of light coming back up the passage. And he came in and said, well, you just wouldn't believe how beautiful that waterfall was. She said, I, I can trust you on it. Let's get out of here. Uh, and uh, she... Uh, made a decision that day that she had done a caving experience twice, her first and her last time, because the darkness was just too much for her. I think you can understand that if you think about it. Darkness is scary. Things go on in darkness that we don't want, but the world loves darkness because the world has things going on that shouldn't be going on. But it's our nature because... 
as we've said several times in this sermon series, and we'll say again, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. And you see, all of us are at the very best a sinner saved by grace. Uh, That's the very best, and it's the very least. A sinner saved by grace. That grace came at a tremendous price. Jesus came and took the place of the serpent. He was nailed on the cross, and he suffered and died there for all the sin of the world, all that had ever been to that point, all that was right there then, and all that was ever to come. He even prayed to his executioners, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. And he died on that cross. As I said earlier, Nicodemus was among those. He and Joseph of Arimathea, they came and got the body of Jesus and buried it, risking their lives to be crucified too. And then on the third day, he rose again. You see, death was defeated. A light, triumphant, darkness was defeated. But many in the world still choose darkness. And it's rampant in all the societies of the world, in all of the horrible and devious things that happen. And God wants us to accept salvation. Not to earn it. You can't earn it. Not that you're entitled to it because you've done nothing worthy of it except being loved by God. And the gift is there. All you have to do is accept the gift. It's free. And say, yes, Lord. And in accepting that gift, you're born by water into spirit, which Jesus told Nicodemus. You're a child of the light. And you move forward then, living in the light, knowing that the darkness is going to attack you in all manner of ways, but knowing that Jesus is stronger than the darkness. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote that uh, the movement from death to life is through the cross. Only through the cross, through Jesus. There's no other way. So uh, we need to accept the gift of salvation today. To realize it's a gift and we accept it. And to put aside what the world says and move forward with the key verses. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. That's a message for everybody. That's the message that we need to have. That's the message we need to dwell on as we come to our closing hymn, Where He Leads Me. It's in your bulletin. Let us stand and sing together.
So we go with them, living by grace. We can do our works to show how much grace is meant to us, but we live by grace. And remember, it's not the buildings, finances, community problems, doctrines, debates, internal controversies, opinions, political issues, all those have their place. But the real thing is the real thing, and that is Jesus. We are saved by his grace, and that's the precious gift. So go today, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, accepting the gift of salvation now and forever. Amen.